All right, we are live and recording, at least according to my notification. So hello, everyone. If you could help me out and type yes in the chat, if you can hear me and see me so that I know that you've got me, that would be great. And then as you do that, a little bit of housekeeping. Yes, yes, excellent, great. Hi, everyone. Hi, Ruth. Hi, Barry. Hi, Nicholas. Welcome back. Um, so here's how this will roll. Let me do a little bit of housekeeping and then we'll get into the material. So there's a poll that I posted. Hopefully you can see it. There are a couple like simple multiple choice about your niche. And if you can answer that, that would be helpful so that I know where you are relative to the question of niching down um, and target the content that is right towards where you are. So if you can't see it, let me know. And, um, and I'll see if I can fix it. All right. This is meant to be informal. So please put your questions in the chat. Feel free to say um, whatever else is on your mind so that we can make it conversational. I think a lot of CPAs and accountants deal with the same kinds of challenges, especially when it comes to selecting a narrower position or niching down. So when you share your perspective and other people um, other people can relate to it. So please feel free to put your questions in the chat and your comments as well. Also know that if I mention anything that I might send you something, I have your email addresses that happens, those get captured when you register. So don't worry about that. And then today I'll probably talk for 15 to 20 minutes, incorporate your questions as we go and then I can stay on for up to 45 minutes and we'll just go as long as people have questions. If you need to jump off at any time, you're more than welcome to. You can just duck out the back door and this recording will be available at the same URL shortly after we're done. It just takes a few minutes to buffer and then you can watch the replay. So when it comes to, hi Lisa, welcome back. Glad to see your name there. So when it, so let me check in on the poll. Are you guys able to see the poll? Let me see if, all right, great. You don't know what your next step would be and you can't figure out what niche to pick. Okay, great. So I'll address, those are the top two answers. Um, okay, awesome. Thank you. All right. So give me a little bit of um, your perspective, your feedback, in more words than just the poll is available. What's keeping you from niching right now? You don't know what your next step would be, but where are you in the process? Are you a CPA who will take any and all comers just about? Um, do you currently have something of a niche, something of a direction, but you're not sure if it's the right one? Um, you don't wanna get too specific. You're not sure um, if it's a viable niche, like people often cite restaurants as you wouldn't want to niche into restaurants right now. Tell me what's on your mind specifically when it comes to niching. And in particular, are you, what I'd love to know is, are you, how convinced are you that it is a good idea, but you just don't know how to do it versus still not convinced that it's a good idea? because those are two different problems and I can speak to both of them, but if there's a heavy, like if there's a gravitational pull toward one or the other, I'll spend more time on it. Because if you're still not not yet convinced that it's a good idea, I'll start with that, that would make logical sense. But if everybody's on board that it's a good idea and you just don't know how, then I'll skip convincing you that it's a good idea. So. All right. Uh, excellent. Great. Thank you for sending this in. So Barry says some niches, but by accident, hard to imagine how to find you in the process. Okay. Struggle with doing it when you're in central Kansas. Okay. Gotcha. Um, okay. I have a niche small business owned run by women, but I wonder if I need to niche down further. Okay. Ruth short answer is it, I think it would help you to yes. And Jennifer, I haven't tried niche yet, but I would have to be cloud based to pick a niche. Don't know how to do it. Got it. And Liesl says, convinced it's a good idea. I already have different lines of business that are active and continue to produce income. My struggle is to manage that and niche at the same time. Okay, great. 
So it sounds like for the most part, you are on board that it's generally a good idea to niche. So I will, in that case, speed through the advantages and get right into um, how to do it and what to be on the lookout for and some pieces of the process that I think can facilitate or accelerate um, or at least move more quickly your, your process of narrowing your niche and being able to provide more value to your clients so that you can raise your fees because that's the biggest advantage. So in terms of speeding through um, the advantages of niching or the disadvantages of not being um, diff- not having a clear position in the marketplace is that it's really hard for great uh, great prospects to find you. It's sort of like if you remember in the olden days when we had TVs that if you you know you turn the channel and it would just be static, right? Black and white. <sighs> or if you turn the dial on the radio between 87 and 107 in between signals, it would just be <sighs> And without a signal, without your business sending out a clear signal of who you work with, you're just in between the numbers on the dial and people cannot find you. They just, they overlook you. You just like, they're turning the dial, looking for a CPA who helps online business owners. And they just go right by because you're not sending a signal that that's who you work with. So it seems counterintuitive, but when you're undifferentiated People cannot, good people have a very hard time finding you. The tendency is also that those who do find you think of you as a CPA, an accountant, and they want certain services from you and they they just want the services. And it, it ends up, you kind of end up in this position where your clients are telling you what they want and they're sort of driving the bus, which is not an advantageous position for you. And it's if you have this symptom of business clients who are business owners and their businesses are a mess and you know they could be more profitable but you just don't have time to help them that's a symptom of that's a a position where you're mis- potentially missing an opportunity to be able to help your clients drive more profitability in their business because you have a lot of work going on in your in a bunch of directions and it's hard to have a process where you can consistently drive high quality results for your clients when you can consistently drive high quality results for your clients that are predictable, your they will get more value from working with you. When they get more value, your fees can go up in line with the value that they're getting. And it makes it easier for clients just like them to find you, other clients who are just like them, to, uh, sorry, prospects to find you. So, and then you start to have a lot of clients who look like each other, and then you can systematize how you work with them, improve your process, drive even greater results so that becomes a virtuous cycle. And there's one other piece I was going to add to that. Systematization, I'll come, it'll come back. So there are all kinds of all kinds of great reasons why niching can be so helpful, so helpful for your business, more profitable. And you you have fewer things to focus on. So you get your time back, right? Because because you can systematize you become more efficient. And this all comes assuming that part of this process is moving off of hourly billing if you're not already. And the piece that I was gonna add in in there is that when you have a lot of clients who look like each other, you can start to identify the patterns that they're all struggling with. And when you can identify the patterns, that starts to drive expertise. And when you drive expertise, you drive intellectual property and you get asked to be on podcasts, to speak at conferences, and um, and maybe write books. Books unto themselves are not that profitable, but books drive prospects coming to you. So it, the whole thing becomes a virtuous cycle. All right. So let me catch up on the notes here. All right. Nicholas says it's a good idea. I haven't, I haven't begun to target the client in that niche. Okay. Can I have a Maserati instead of a bus? <laughs> Yes. I love the analogy. I'm going to run with it. When you're, when you focus on a certain, uh, a very narrow segment of people you serve, you get to have the Maserati and drive it and you get to put your client in the passenger seat and you're both delighted. So yeah. And you have, you don't have to drive a bus full of like a heavy load of clients. You can, 
only drive, you can work with a much lighter footprint of clients because the fees, the value goes up, the fees go up, therefore fewer clients in order to make the same amount of money. Okay. So having read the e-myth and the e-myth for accountants, is it still, is it still, it still seems almost impossible to systematize. Um, okay. So let me address that quickly. Let's see. still seems almost impossible to systematize. I would have to, okay, so Jennifer, where are you? Okay, so let me get into all these questions in here. Jennifer, where are you in the niching? You haven't niched yet. Have to be cloud-based. Don't know how to do it, niching, I mean. Okay, so let me talk about it broadly, how to systematize. So let's just pick an example of a niche that somebody might be in. Everybody loves to pick on dentists, so I'll just keep going with them. It's a really, it's a nice niche because it's, um, the, it's really specific. The buying power of the business owner, the dentist is there. And, um, and it's not as messy as other forms of medicine, like, um, practice physicians, which are sort of caught in this morass of the insurance industry, which makes business much more complicated because dentists are, you know, sometimes there's a, some amount of insurance involved, but the pricing is much more predictable. The payment's much more predictable and the, the dollar amounts make the whole thing pencil for you as an accountant or CPA. So let's pick on dentists and let's just say you could do something like um, improve the way that you work with dentists is advisory light and you help them improve their profitability over a three-year span, right? And so, and then you keep them as an ongoing client, but there are probably some predictable things that you do. So we come into a typical dentist practice. They tend to have typical challenges, right? So, um, or predictable challenges. They have an overlapping subset of challenges, let's say. So they probably have the, some of the predictable challenges they have are uh, late cancellations. Maybe they don't have a clear cancellation policy. Maybe they don't have a way, a good way to collect uh, fees for cancellation policies. <clears throat> maybe they don't keep credit cards on files, but on file, but maybe they could. Um, so they have empty chair time that is not being used. Maybe the dentist, you know, has gotten really busy. Their practice has grown. They haven't had time in three years to review their pricing. So they haven't updated their prices annually to keep uh, pace with inflation, rise in costs, and so on. Um, maybe they too are serving everybody and they might be better served to narrow who they work with. Um, I don't actually, I don't love that idea, but you could potentially like <clears throat> if somebody wanted, if a dentist wanted to niche into family dentistry, right, where they only worked with families and had young kids and stuff, that could be an option, but let me not go down that tangent. So dentist has a bunch of predictable challenges, namely they are, um, their chair is empty a certain portion of the time and that needs to be corrected. They may struggle with cancellation related challenges and their fees may be uh, too low and who knows, maybe um, nobody knows about them, right? And so their chairs sit empty, their marketing is ineffective, they're not reaching into the community somehow. So if you were so these are all just business problems, not to mention the accounting problems, which I'll come to in a second. But if you were working in an advisory capacity and you had a checklist of, that was just four, but say you had a checklist of 10 things that you knew where you could predictably help them recover some hidden cash, you could move them through a process over the year where you chip away at these problems, right? And you have 10 steps and you work on it from January to December and you recover hidden profits in their business. From the accounting standpoint, you would have a chart of accounts that is tailored to dentists, whatever that might look like, thinking about the way that they think about things. Um, you would have sort of standards for when they're getting paid, how they're getting paid. You would have metrics and KPIs that would um, be tailored right to dentists. Like um, you would have a sense, let's just pretend here that you had, let's pretend you lived in a midsize, like a... A, a large town or a very small city, something like 250,000 to a million. And so let's say you had 10 dentists, you would have the data across 10 dentists of what is possible in terms of chair occupancy rate. And you would know what, um, what people have, what dentists have done to optimize their chair occupancy. 
you would know what metrics and KPIs to be looking at and to measure. And you could include those in your, um, in your meetings with your clients. You would have a sense of cash flow and how long cash flow takes, or um, sorry, I'm saying two things here. You would have a sense of cash flow when it comes in, when it goes out, when vendors are being paid and all the rest. You would have a sense of when, uh, when patients pay, how long it takes to pay. You might have a system for shortening that timeline so people get paid faster. There are all kinds of ways that when you work with people who are all doing the same thing, that you can systematize your own processes for how you work with them. But when you have a dentist, a manufacturing company, the pharmacy across town, the running shoe store, there's it's too all over the place to develop any kind of system. All right, let me come back to some of the other ones higher up. Okay, because of all the idiosyncrasies involved, this is still Jennifer with all the different clients and how they bring in their paperwork. Yes, exactly. It makes it, yes, it makes an idea. Yes, okay. So coming back to the dentist, you would drive your Maserati <laughs> with when you take on a dentist, here's how this rolls and you drive the Mater Maserati. I have a process for you for here's how you're gonna deliver me your paperwork. Here's when you're gonna get it to me. And, um, you know, you're going to get it to me. I'm going to make up some numbers here on the fifth of every month. You're going to deliver this thing to the secret lockbox in my, at the front door, and I'm going to go through it. And by the 15th of the month, I'm going to have everything back to you. And in the third week of the month, we're going to meet, we're going to go over your financials. We're going to go through this, this, and this, and then you're, we're going to, you're going to, we'll see what decisions get made next. And we'll hold you accountable for those action items in the next meeting the following month. But you drive the bus for how it works and you only take on clients who want to get into your Maserati for how you work. If they don't want to get into your system, you don't take them on because you're like, mm, nope, sorry. In order for me to make meaningful change for you in your business and to keep the business run, like you don't say this, but in order to keep my margins high and my time effective, it needs to be on my terms. If they don't want to agree to your terms, there are 200,000 other dentists in this country that you could potentially work with. So, um, okay, so let me come up to Barry, some niches, but by accident, hard to imagine how to fine tune the process. What do you, Barry, what do you mean by some niches, but by accident? Struggle with doing it, uh, you're in central Kansas. Okay, let me address the geography aspect for a moment. One of the things that I love about COVID is it accelerated the shift to online. So now you can be anywhere in rural America, have a Wi-Fi, a internet connection, and work with just about, I wouldn't say just about, but it makes it so much easier to work either throughout your state or across state lines. Kansas, I don't know what your population is, but presumably you've got a million people in Kansas. You probably have, or in Kansas, there are probably when you niche, you don't need nearly as many business owners. You don't need nearly as many clients. Like it goes into the between 10 and 50 kind of thing instead of 100 to 500 to 5,000. So if you think about just staying inside Kansas, what kinds of businesses there are that there are, you know, 500 of, and there, I'm confident that there is ample opportunity just inside Kansas and you don't have to cross state lines. Let me give you an example. I had a client in Montana. Montana has a million people or less. And he niched into, or they, it was a pair, uh, cannabis and construction. Cannabis, because it kind of comes with its risk and it's like a little unpredictable and its whole thing. And they didn't want to go whole hog into cannabis balance out the risk. Construction has its ebbs and flows in terms of uh, the re recessions and, um, you know, surges and growth and stuff. So that would, that, and by having two, by having two niches that they would kind of hedge their risks of like huge peaks and huge valleys, right? And that the two operated on sort of different wavelengths and would provide stable cash flow. So anyways, it was a great idea. They're doing super well. And they basically have the corner on all cannabis in all of Montana. 
So, and it probably took two years, you know, they started out with one cannabis shop and then, you know, that grew three and then they expanded throughout town and then people started coming throughout the state and then people started coming from outside the state, Colorado and then Washington and so on. So then they started taking out of staters. And then construction, there's plenty of construction in Montana, so they don't need to go across state lines for construction. So, um, okay. So let me come back to your uh, I have accumulated several. Con okay. So contractors are great. That's a great niche with the exception, of course, is that sometimes construction has slowdowns, right? But you can hedge against that. There are ways to hedge against that. So let me go back to your original thing, Barry. It says, I understand the importance, but I struggle to do it in central Kansas. Okay. So let's take contractors in central Kansas. What is the struggle about potentially niching in the direction of contractors being in central Kansas? What's, what's the, what is the struggle exactly? Okay. And I'll come back to you. So Ruth says, I have a niche small business owned run by women, but I'm wondering if I need to niche even further. Okay. So my hunch for you, Ruth, I'm going to see if you add in anything else lower. Um, my hunch is that a couple things women owned is is great once you get niched down far enough but women owned small business isn't quite niched enough cuz women owned unto itself there are a lot of women owned businesses and it doesn't indicate that just because i'm a woman owned business doesn't mean you know my problems right or not me specifically but that's what the woman female business owner might think like, that's great that you work with women. I love that. But that doesn't mean that you understand my business challenges. So that unto itself isn't quite specific enough. Small business owners are all is also really big, right? How many small business owners are there? Like the vast majority of businesses are small businesses. And same as the as being a women owned women owned business, just because I'm a small business owner doesn't mean you understand my problems. Like, how are you going to help me? How are you going to add value to my business if I'm pushing back, right? So I think it's headed in the right direction. And I think you can go a step further by asking what kind of small businesses. And you can ask your, so I would ask you, what do you gravitate toward naturally? And there's some obvious, there are some predictable niches that I think are really great to go for when you're starting out. Um, okay, so off the cuff, a lot of people don't like inventory and retail. So if you don't like those, <laughs> let's uh, shed that option. Professional services is a really nice option because there tends to be uh, sufficient buying power. And by sufficient buying power, I mean anything north of 300,000, you start starts to be sufficient. 500,000 to a million has sufficient buying power and um, is still a small business that's not very complex still. So it makes your learning curve shorter. So in professional services, I split that into at least two, the creative types of the web designers, the ad agencies, the marketing people, the marketing type consultants, um, the graphic designers, those creative types who might have, you know, colorful, crazy hair and, um, you know, are like creatives, right? They're not the, by contrast, button down professional services of architects, lawyers, engineers, and CPAs and accountants. Those are more button down, white button down shirt, press pants, the whole bit. So inside professional services, if that was a niche that anybody here liked, I would suggest getting specific and kind of either going the creative angle, going down the creative branch, or going down the professional services branch, uh, sorry, the the more traditional traditional lawyers, engineers, architects, whatever we want to call them. And heading in that direction and saying, for example, on your website, though naming three, which I'll come back to in a sec if um, if time allows. Okay, so those are some good niches. Dentists are great. Dentists are great. If you're feeling a little bit more, um, if you have an interest, gamers, the gaming industry <laughs> is going bananas. And those folks, <laughs> I can't even tell you, but a lot of them don't even, they're not even in the right entity. They're making hundreds of thousands of dollars and they're LLCs, right? And they're just getting hosed on self-employment tax and they don't even realize it, right? And probably most of them, like half of them are 26 
they have no idea what self-employment tax is. They, all the money that comes in the door, they think that they can just spend it. So April comes around and their CPA says, oh, you owe $40,000 in taxes. And the gamer's like, I what? And they have saved nothing for their tax bill, right? Because they're 26. So um, that's an interesting niche. Or if you were feeling a little bit more, if you had an interest, crypto, NFTs, that kind of stuff. So there are, there are plenty of niches to go in the direction of. And I wanted to just kind of give you a sense of some easy first places to start. All right, let me see if... Okay, so Ruth, I was kind of in your question about uh, wondering if I should niche down further. Yes, 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 yes. And give me some feedback about what of those industries or professions I named that might be interesting to you. And I can see if I can help you kind of clarify a little bit more. Um, okay, let me come back to, let me see if I've got an update from Barry or Ruth. Okay, thanks. That's really helpful. Great. Tell me what, um, Tell me what's more, tell me what was helpful or what's more clear to you now. And then Barry says our population, our community is 15,000. So reaching beyond my primary trade area seems difficult. Why does it seem difficult? Um, because heading in the direction of being more online, it seems, it seems to me like, so I want to know what's difficult about reaching beyond your primary trade area. 1,200 tax clients, so my time is stretched. Okay, great. Yes, I'm struggle with firing clients to focus on niches. Yes, it's hard to change. Yes, okay, great. Okay, okay, now I can, this is, this is great. All right, 1,200 tax clients. So let me organize my thoughts for you. Given, here's, here's how I might think about this. 1,200 tax clients. If you like construction, I might consider trades as a broad place to start. So HVAC, drywall, painters, um, but the, the ones who are profitable, probably less the one man shops because they can be so messy, right? And um, their potential is, oh, is maybe not there, but the more, the plumbers who have, you know, four plumbing trucks, for example, and we love plumbing and we love heating, especially in Kansas when there's cold winter, when people's pipe, when people have plumbing problems, they find money, right? When people have heating problems in the wintertime, they find money. So these are businesses that tend to be recession proof. So construction, plumbing, HVAC as possible ideas. And these are folks who you know, are in the trades, got started in the trades, making a go of it, probably have the potential to make decent money, make a decent living at it, but aren't necessarily strong on the financial, the number side, and could really use some guidance getting smarter about how they manage their money throughout the year in their business. Especially if you've got heating and cooling, I'm imagining it's hot in the summertime, maybe there are quiet times, how does, how does the HVAC company um, manage their cash flow in the shoulder seasons when it's neither super hot nor super cold. That might be an interesting problem to solve. So I, I would think, so one idea of possibility is to head in the direction of these kinds of businesses who are in the north of $300,000, $500,000 in gross revenue annually. And what are their expensive problems? And to just start talking to them to find out what they want to do with their businesses that they find themselves unable to do because they don't know how. And then finding out some of those things will not be in your wheelhouse, of course, but some of them might be. So trying to figure out what you can do to help improve their situation, because the more that you can improve their situation, the larger the delta, if you will, between where they are now and where they want to be and your contribution to that, the more value it is for them and the more you can improve your fees. The more you can improve your fees, the more you can look at your tax, your 1200 tax folks and go, okay, now I'm in a position of having better income. I no longer need as many of these tax clients. Tax clients. I'm in more of a place of choice of power. Who do I really want to keep? And what are my options for either shedding some, or do I want to hire a tax manager to take on more of the tax clients? Can I system How can I, what can I do to systematize the heck out of the tax clients 
because there's not a lot of money to squeeze from the 10, especially the 1040 sponge. There's just not a lot of profit to squeeze from that. There's more from on the business uh, return side, but still there's relatively speaking, there's so much more potential profit when you get into advisory light, even just advisory light, right? I'm talking 7,500 to 25,000 a year for something like semi-annual or quarterly meetings and keeping your business owners on track relative to their budget and their cash flow and maybe some um, forecasting. Okay, <laughs> I can go down rabbit holes. Let me get myself back. So I would, in sort of in summary for you, Barry, I would look, I might consider how can I optimize the heck out of my 1200 tax clients so that I can free up my time? Can I, fi can I find a tax manager to take some of these folks over so that I'm not buried by tax season? Can I um, collect payment up front in either December, January, or per perhaps 50% down for um, my clients so that I don't get like completely snowed under in April when everyone's like, oh, right, tax time. I should call Barry. Um, so to smooth out that workflow so you don't get so that you don't get so that your business growth doesn't get sucked under by tax season. And then um, on the niche side, can I'd perhaps consider contractors, HVAC plumbers as a starting place, start talking to them, find out what business challenges they have, what do they want to do with their business, and what of those challenges fall inside your lane, your wheelhouse, and um, and see if there's a way to offer kind of something, some, a starting point of advisory light packages. I'm not sure what you're already doing. Okay. Uh, let me see. Come back to Ruth. From the ones you named, I would say professional services and the creative types. Oh, research-based companies. Interesting. I'm not sure if that niche is considered creative or not. Definitely not traditional. I don't know what research-based companies are. I'd have to know more about that. Never thought of gamers and <laughs> gamers. I'm telling you, there's a lot of potential revenue there. They are kids <laughs> and there's a lot about the world they don't know yet. You can make a big dent financially. You can help them financially quite a bit. Uh, okay, professional services. So there's, yeah, so the creatives are great because they're creatives and they're kind of all over the map. You've got to know if you like working with creatives or not because they're a little hard. They're like frogs in a wheelbarrow. They go all over the place. So you have to like that sort of personality and working with that kind of person or the way that they think. Um, but they are so, they tend to be so grateful for their accountant or CPA's expertise because they struggle and they are afraid of money and they don't know what to do with it and they don't know if they're doing it right and they don't like, they don't know. So it's really easy to, re relatively, it's pretty easy to add a lot of value for creatives because of their creative side and their non sort of linear thinking financial side. Versus like if you work with physicians, physicians want to be the smartest one in the room and it's hard to kind of, they're difficult. Apparently I don't work with any physicians, but the word on the street from CPAs is that physicians are difficult because they're know-it-alls. They tend to be know-it-alls. So it's harder to add value because they already know the tax code and they teach you things according to CPAs that I've spoken with. So let me come back to some other folks I haven't touched on yet. Um, there was a name I saw, Yearly. How early is too early to niche? Never too early. Never, ever. Well, let me take that back. I think that if I were an accountant or CPA, I'd want to get some like generalist experience for three to five years to really understand under somebody else's wing or tutelage. Um, but meanwhile, while I did that, I would also start learning about pick a niche and just start learning. And the thing about that is that even if you pick an air quotes, the wrong niche, what you learn from the process of learning how to niche is that now you know how to do it. And if you don't like your niche, you can just pick up <laughs> and just plop down in another niche because you understand the process, how it feels, what to look for, how to learn, what to learn and all the rest. So I think that it's never too early to start focusing on a niche, on an industry that you want to deepen your expertise in. For example, less than a year in, I don't have the volume number stats to go through the niche selection formula. Right. Okay. You don't have enough. Gotcha. So you don't have enough of a sample size to go through the process. Okay. 
So I, I would say still not too early to niche. I think the financial aspect of niching in that you get to add so that when you focus your expertise, you add more value, which leads to more fees um, or higher fees is so compelling. And because so few, relatively speaking, CPAs are niched that it is there's a very low bar, very low hurdle for being able to stand out. And the minute you can stand out as somebody who has even some amount of not just expertise, but let's call it starting out, let's just call it familiarity. So you've got familiarity, let's pretend with something I haven't uh, gone through yet. Let's do real estate investors. If you've got some amount of familiarity with real estate investors because maybe your parents had a few uh, quadplexes or maybe you have some rental properties of your own or some investments or something like that, if you have passing familiarity with these things and you can work with your and you can say, look, I work with business owners who have real estate investments as something of a side hustle or straight up real estate investors and that's all you do and you are, you even have a sense of like, if you can just rattle off five problems that real estate investors have, that real estate investor investor client prospect is going to be like, oh, you actually have some sense of my problems. This is good, right? And then you begin working together. And then as you go, you learn more and more and more about their challenges and their problems and the solutions and the things they need that they couldn't even have thought of because they don't know tax or accounting. So... Let me see if I answered your question. Yeah, so if you're too, if you're still in the early stages of your business, I think still pick an industry or a profession that you just find interesting and start reading up on them. I'll come back to the process. Start reading up on them and just start getting familiar with how you might think about solving problems that you think you can help with. And then if you head down that niche, and you turns out you don't like it because it feels like a shirt that's too tight in the shoulders. You just go, okay, no thanks. I'm going to go over here to this other industry and I'm going to start studying up on this. And you just go through the same process. I will tell you a quick story <laughs> of my own process. And that is when I started coaching about five or six years ago, I thought that I should go into corporate because that's, you know, where there's money and buying power and so on. So I niched into like leadership kind of coaching and corporate -y stuff. And I bought a couple of books on coaching executives and coaching leaders and that kind of thing. And I got, I was like six weeks in and I was like, Ugh, I hate it in here. It is so starched, stale, dry, boring. These are not my people. I do not know corporate. I've never worked inside corporate. I've never wanted to work inside corporate. I do not like... I do not understand it inside here. I do not like it. I felt the resistance. I was in a mastermind at the time. I was kind of casually talking about it. And a bunch of people were like, do you even like it in here? And I was like, no. And they said, why are you here? And I was like, because I think I'm supposed to be. And they said, no, 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 no. Back out. So I was six weeks into this niche and I just backed all the way out and started over. And I did I lose six weeks? Yep. But I would have lost more weeks had I forced myself like made myself go through heavy resistance to niche in a direction that totally felt unnatural to me. So know that sometimes the process of finding our niche is very much, can be a process of elimination of like, nope, not here. How about I go over here? Nope, not here. How about I go? Oh, I like this. Okay. Let me follow my curiosity. There is that sort of element. It's not uncommon to have that sort of element of like, let me try this on for size. And realize that when you try it on, you're like, actually, no. And that's that's part of it. Staying put, though, is oh, uh, will be a more costly decision. You're better off trying and making mistakes than not trying anything at all. All right, let me come back to see where we are here. Nicholas says, I like the idea of creating a niche in the professional services industries. Professional services are a great place to niche. Um, like I said earlier, try and pick the, um, because nobody, the architect, the lawyer, the engineer, the creative, the ad person, the marketing consultant, um, none of them at a cocktail party when asked, what do you do for a living? What do you do for a living? 
exactly none of them will say, I'm a professional service provider. No one ever says that. What they will say is, I'm an architect, I'm an engineer, I'm a consultant, I'm a, I run a marketing company. So in your marketing of your niche, it's you, you'll be better off saying, um, so if you niche in the direction of personal professional services, in your own mind, secretly, you can think professional services, but outwardly, you would use the words, I work with architects and engineers and consultants, and I help them improve their profitability and save on tax. And you would name the professions inside the professional services that you target. And then you would do that for six months, and then it would turn out that you would like the engineers more than you like the architects, I'm pretending here. And so you would shed the architects. And you might still like the lawyers and you're not sure between the lawyers and the engineers which ones you like. So you go for another six months and it turns out that you don't like the lawyers either. So you shed the lawyers and you still have the engineers. So that's kind of the process that could be a process for progressing into professional services. Um, and I'll tell you also my own story on that one, Nicholas, because when I started, so let me go back. So <laughs> I didn't like the corporate thing. And then I had a lot of friends and colleagues coming to me for business coaching. And then I had some CPAs, two CPAs asked me if I could help them. And at this, and around the same time I had, I was working with two coaches and both of them said to me, Geraldine, go in the direction of financial. You're a clear natural. You love it. You gravitate toward it. You can talk money and numbers and math all day long. Nobody else likes it. <laughs> Right. Other business coaches don't tend to go in this direction. Nobody, most others are not. And you love it. It would be great for you. And I was like, huh? I couldn't see it because I love numbers. Like who doesn't want to talk money and math all day? <laughs> doesn't everybody? But they were, every, but the people I was working with were like, no. So I trusted them and I went in the direction of financial services, but financial services is like professional services. It's still really broad. It includes the financial planners and um, bookkeepers, accountants, CPAs. So I went in the direction of financial services. And then very quickly, I was like, I need to not include the CFPs and the um, CMA or like all the alphabet soup of those, of those folks, the investor types. So I went with bookkeepers, um, accountants, and CPAs. And then pretty soon after that, I was like, oh, CPAs and accountants makes more sense. And then um, and then now CPAs. And some accountants still come to me and say, and EAs will still come to me and say, can you help me? And provided that their problems fall inside my lane and I think I can help them, I might say yes, depending on my capacity and so on. But my marketing is very much towards CPAs because there are plenty of CPAs. And still there are CPAs at various revenue levels and so I go for the ones around a million dollars because they have a certain subset of problems. They tend to want to want their time more than they want more money. Whereas at a hundred thousand, they tend to want more money and they're still willing to work really hard, right? So different set of problems at different revenue levels. And I tend to talk to women. Do I work with men? Yes. I love working with men, but I talk to women because I'm one and I get women and I enjoy working with them. So as that's my niching, that was sort of my experience of niching and the process and all of that has taken over time about three years. So um, from when I committed to professional services, then financial services. So just to give you a sense of kind of how it can flow in real life, because it, I could have picked, you know, three years ago, I could have picked CPAs with a million dollars in revenue, but that would have felt way too scary and uncertain. Right. So I kind of needed to go through the process of narrowing and shedding what didn't what no longer made sense. OK, I'm going to catch up on more chats and also tell me what's helpful so that I can kind of steer go in that direction. Um, let me catch up. Let me catch up. Where am I? All right. So Ruth, professional services. Yep, we got that one. Gamer story. Yes. Oh my gosh. Jennifer Bright. <laughs> yes. Singers who get paid a lot by fans on YouTube and Instagram. There are these like new revenue models that are non-traditional revenue models where business owners are making money. I mean, singers, a business owner is making money in ways that a lot of us are like, wait, what? You do what now? You get paid how now? 
And it's it's not widely figured out because the business model of accounting and CPAs is still kind of traditional. So if you can be one of the first ones to the line to figure out some of these newer things that are happening and understand these folks, singers who are launching their, you know, stuff, they've got songs on iTunes. I don't even know what, um, but they're figure out their revenue streams. I mean, influencers, like <laughs> how many of us, I'm 45, right? So an influencer to me is like, you do what now? You go stand in front of the Taj Mahal and get your photo taken and people pay you like, huh? But if you're making that person's making a lot of money, <laughs> I don't even know how it works, but they're pro if they don't know, they're going to get hammered on self-employment tax if they're an LLC. So if you can, if a, like, I think it would be an interesting niche to niche into influencers and understand their business model challenges and how they make money and help them be better business owners. I think that'd be really interesting, <laughs> but I kind of, I tend to gravitate towards stuff that's like uh, new and people aren't really doing yet. So that's my own bias. Mo I think most, let me comment on this. Generally, I think CPAs tend to gravitate toward being a CPA because it's fairly predictable and it has some element. It's like no, it has some element of certainty and it's known. So I tend to help people help CPAs niche into traditional tried and true proven kind of industries and professions like dentists, physicians, trades. Um, but for the CPAs who have a little bit more of a risk um, tolerance, and or slightly more adventurous business wise, I think there are some really cool ones like, you know, gamers, online, all this online stuff, e-commerce stuff, Etsy shop owners, influencers, crypto, NFT, that kind of stuff. Um, and because and because CPAs tend to be on the conservative, tend to be somewhat risk averse, the CPA who has more risk tolerance and is slightly more adventurous is going to be the first one or among the first into those industries. And boy, oh boy, when you're the leader, you can get the corner on the market really quickly. All right. Crystal says that's true about doctors. I've worked with them and they're difficult. That is what I hear. Uh, but do you think the creative types will have the revenue to pay? So the revenue to pay start three, north of 300,000 annually, 500,000. Um, they're more willing to pay you a million dollars or more willing to pay you. And because their problems become more expensive, you know, the more zeros you add to the end of their revenue, the more expensive every single problem is just because it's bigger. And that becomes, that makes it easier to provide value, more value, more quantitative value, which then pushes your fees. So um, I think the question, do they have the revenue to pay? Well, you've got to look in you know, when you're in discovery, you ask them about what their revenue is. And in time, you'll find out, you'll get to know, you would get, I don't want to be too presumptuous here, but you would get to know your niche. Um, and you would have a sense of when, like at what gross revenue size, it makes sense for people to start to work with you. And what you could have at certain levels, I'm going to take this a step further, is let's just say under 100,000, a creative under 100,000 might still be a solo shop. So you might figure out a way to, this is another advantage of niching that we haven't talked about, is you might figure out a way to offer them help and service that's scaled down um, and productized like a digital product where you have an ebook for them, maybe you have a checklist, maybe you have like a five video, maybe you record five 20 minute videos and you package it up and you sell it to them for, I don't know, 500 bucks and it helps them make some more money and they stair step up and four months later they come back to you and they've got a little bit more money and then they buy <clears throat> at the next level up rung on the ladder from you and they kind of stair step up into working with you at high, um, at, at your sort of standard level, right? So a way to say that more concisely is if they're underneath your ideal revenue level for your sort of full scale service, you can give them things that can help them grow into the profitability that they need to buy your full service. And by give them things, I mean like info products, digital products, ebooks, checklists, all the rest. Or yeah. Okay. Um, let me get back to your creative one. If they're all over the place, I worry they'll be focused on their business and can, and consistently make money. If they're all over the place, I worry if they will be focused on their business and consistently make money. I don't know if I, I don't think I understand, but I'm going to take a guess. Um, 
So see if you can get a narrow revenue range like 500,000 to a million or 300,000 to 3 million. Um, and here's what I think. The niching process is very much a learning process. So don't worry about not knowing things. When you have a thought in your head, I don't know if this, I don't know if that, but what if this, but what if that? <laughs> Acknowledge your thoughts. Say like, thank you, thought. Here's a cookie. Go sit in the corner. I'm going to go learn about my niche. And in continuing to learn about your niche, you will find out how to work with what works for them and works for you. And it's, it, it does require some courage to be open to experimenting with what does work and what doesn't work. And I learned similarly that a CPA who is under a hundred thousand, I can't help yet because having not been a CPA, I don't know how to build a business from the ground up. I can't, it's really hard for me to take a CPA from zero or 50,000 because there's still so many business fundamentals that they need that I can't give them because I haven't been through that process. Um, but once somebody is at, you know, 250,000, they have the buying power and enough business that we can look at what they have, <clears throat> excuse me. And given my business background and skill set and everything, we can, I know, and I, I've, I know what they need, but I don't want to say I know what they need. The problems, they're problems I can help with, right? Because they become business strategy problems rather than CPA building a brand new practice problem. But I had to learn that. I had to learn that by working with a couple of CPAs who were under 100,000 and didn't, um, and it was just, my, it was a different problem set and it was difficult for, like, I just couldn't help them in the way that they need help. So these are some of the things that you learn along the way. And we just have to learn by doing. It's like riding a bike. The, <clears throat> you can only, there's only so much reading a book about how to ride a bike that's going to help you ride the bike, right? You've got to get your butt in the saddle and you've got to learn it by feel. And that's the way to ride a bike. Um, theory and videos only gets you so far. All right. Um, let me see. I've got to catch up, catch up, catch up. All right, eight minutes. I'm going to talk fast. A <laughs> uh, few lawyers find uh, lawyers also have a reputation for being difficult. Um, and there are cool lawyers out there. There are there are definitely good lawyers out there, but on, on average, they have a reputation for being difficult. Um, they are gifts. Gifts are not taxable in Canada. Okay, I'm going to. Try and stay out of the technical. I know a few CPAs who do only pro musicians. Yes, I, I've heard about. I know. I know of one. Small market seems the ones with the right buying power. Some unique problems. Some might be worth looking into. Worth looking into. Um, definitely worth looking into. With some like, how would I know if this wasn't a go? Um, I think there are probably a lot of starving ar artist musicians. I think you, those are the ones you'd want to stay away from. So I think you'd have to know the industry. I also find the influencer industry really interesting as a niche I've been considering. I mean, I'm really curious and I can't say that I know that it's viable, but I, I, I think it's interesting. Also like bloggers, online course creators, I mean, online course creators, holy smokes. <laughs> when online course creators do launches that are like six and seven figure and eight figure launches and stuff like I made a million dollars today by sending out one email, you're like, huh, what, how does that work? There's so much scale in the online course world that um, online courses, online educators, that whole, there's a lot of potential business in there. Um, and the business model is really straightforward. It, like compared to restaurants, you're not dealing with perishables and lettuce, it's gone bad. And like all this tips and all this stuff, like the online, that business model of online um, business owners, course creators and stuff uh, and all the rest is a really simple, straightforward, clean business model. It does get messy when people have like a Stripe account here and Venmo over there and PayPal over there and you know, they can end up with 17 bank accounts, but that's still a pretty simple problem to solve. Um, great ideas, ebooks, videos for, yes. Oh, my friend. Yes. So that's where this goes, right? Is when you become an expert in a niche, you develop your expertise, you develop intellectual property. And then that that is when you can package up your knowledge and sell it in a digital product and you put it online and somebody adds it to their cart at 10 p.m. You're asleep and you wake up and there's new money in your bank account and you've done nothing. 
to earn, I mean, nothing in air quotes, you can sell it because you spent, invested the time up front gathering the knowledge and putting it together in a package, but then you can sell it at scale without doing any more work and you can go surfing. Um, I mean, that takes a little while. Like <laughs> that's a three to five year timeline, potentially. You mentioned that they can be like, all right, I don't have anything going on. I'm happy to stay along. I know that people probably, some people may need a jet. Um, so let me just say this. And then if folks want a jet, they can. And for folks who want to stay, they can. Um, if you do need to go, before you go, put your most helpful aha or takeaway in the chat so I know what it is, because that helps me create more content like this. Um, and this will be up like in the next half hour if you want to catch the replay at any point. And there are a few more of these coming this week. I might need to reschedule some of the ones later this week. I'll keep you posted. And now back to answering your question. So put, if you have to take off, please put a, a takeaway in the chat for me. I'd appreciate it. You mentioned they can be like frogs in a bucket, which is fine um, as a personality, but a little scary as a business owner. Sure. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so as a business owner, how to deal with, I call them frogs in a wheelbarrow um, because they do. Okay. So what can you do? So I'll, let me give you some ideas of how I handle that. So I'm pretty clear with my clients who are trying to achieve a certain outcome as here's how we work together and I make it fairly structured. Now, my clients are CPAs. They're fairly structured, kind of uh, predictable people. They're not all over the map kind of people. Um, but they still are very much process people. They really like having a process. So we have a process. And um, and in the discovery call, I will, they'll either ask or I'll say, you know, here's what it looks like to work together. We do a long kickoff session. It's, you know, four hours. We make a bunch of progress. We map things out. And then we meet twice a month and we work in a Slack channel. We'll capture all the things that we talk about, like key takeaways and your to-dos, my to-dos, if any, in the Slack channel. You'll have your sort of assignments for the next couple of weeks. And then we'll meet again. And here's, you know, and we'll go over what you got done, where you got stuck along the way, and we'll adjust. And we just keep going. We put that on repeat. Um, and they, we have to know, does that work for you? And if it doesn't work for them, then they get qual they get filtered out right away, right? They've in order for it to work for your business, you've got to have people who are going to work inside the system that's going to get them results. Knowing creative types. It would require you to sort of, you know, I don't know how to say it, but like dig into your intuition or your emotional intelligence and ask yourself, okay, how can I work with these people in a way that um, provides the structure that the accounting aspect needs in order to get them their financials in a timely manner without making them feel like they're sort of pinned down in a straitjacket because creative sort of, they indulge, they they like to be creative and free, but they also have a tendency sometimes to indulge. I like to be free and creative and they sort of, they overdo it, right? But you don't want to trigger that response in, in them. So how can you provide them the structure that they will find beneficial and might in some ways really yearn for because they need, they know they need somebody to rein them in without doing it in a way that's like so strict that they feel confined. And that's for, that's a business sort of challenge curiosity point for you is to ask yourself to work with these folks over time to figure out how to work with them in a way that's effective for them given their personality, but also effective for you given your business. And I know that it's possible because if you look at, for example, Summit CPA, they're in Indiana, they work with creatives, ad agencies, they work with agencies. So that includes creatives and ad people and marketing people and website people. And they have an eight-figure business and of CFO and controller level services and accounting. So they figured out how to make it work. It would be an interesting question to ask them. And I can, I talk to Adam at Summit CPA on the regular, and I can just ask him, like, <laughs> how do you find working with creatives? And like, what do you do to kind of help keep them on the straight and narrow without confined, without them feeling confined? So stay tuned. I will try and ask him that question next time I talk to him and I'll see if I can throw it in an email. 
my daily email. So make sure you're subscribed to my um, my daily email. Okay. Let me see. Let me see. Let me catch up. You meant, okay. So I'm on crystal. You mentioned they can be like frogs in a bucket. Yep. It's helpful. I need to be more comfortable. Yeah, totally. Experimentation. If you're going to go in this direction, which I highly, highly, highly recommend, it is your margins go up. The amount of time it takes go down. The, it goes down. Stress goes down. Predictability goes up. It's, I mean, it's counterintuitive in so many ways, but I have yet to work with a CPA who is niched, who has gone back because they're like, no, 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 I don't like it. Every CPA that I've helped niche is like, ah, this is so much easier, but it does take courage to move down the line. Um, so yes, because like give yourself permission to experiment and test things and like give yourself little safe experiments so that you feel comfortable experimenting without like losing the entire farm. All right, Yearly, if you have a narrow focus horizontally, only sales tax, only tax advisory subscriptions, would you still recommend having a vertical, a narrow vertical niche at the same time? Great question. Um, I would ask you, how easy is it for you to find clients? So I'll answer this two ways. If you don't have a lot of clients yet or sufficient clients, then I might suggest considering adding the vertical. The advantage of the vertical or the vertical position is that it makes it easier to get known by a, a smaller audience. And, um, and when it's, when you get known by a smaller audience by smaller, I mean, like, you know, we're still talking like 20,000 or 200,000. If there's a conference for them, that's small enough. If there's no conference for them, that's too small. If there are trade magazines for them, that's small enough. If there are no trade magazines for them, it's too small. Um, so yes, I would recommend, if you don't have sufficient clients, I would recommend the vertical for the marketing aspect of it. And then once you have sufficient clients, then you can um, start to broaden out and go back to being horizontal. So think of it like a funnel versus an hourglass. So right now you have um, you have the horizontal distinction, narrow vertically by whoever you want to do it for. And then once you once you pass through the narrow neck, then you can broaden out again and um, and then do it for a broad audience. But the the going through the narrow neck of the hourglass, will propel your business and lift your lift your name up you will have more name recognition and then more people will come to you from outside that narrow vertical and that's when you can broaden out again but you need to go through the narrow neck so that you can fill in air quotes fill your business um doing just that one horizontal thing that you do okay ruth it was very helpful to learn um i need to and can niche down further yeah and my homework for this week is Oops. Um, my homework for this week. My aha is the creative type bucket with the professional services industry has been very helpful. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Sidebar, not all CPAs are at all lacking creative. Yeah, it, it is absolutely true that not all CPAs are at all. I mean, th that stereotype exists, but none of my clients are at all. I have really awesome, fun clients. So um, it is absolutely not. It's, yes, I'm in complete agreement. Um, in fact, my data set that says that CPAs are really fun, entertaining, creative, smart, funny people. So, um, so I don't like when people say to me that CPAs are dull, I'm like, they are. Cause like, I don't know any dull CPAs, but I believe that they exist. Um, you serve your clients best by niching and you make more money by doing so. Yes, totally. That is so true. I'm doing my clients. Are just, yeah, it's, that's kind of a heartbreaking piece is that we are doing our clients a disservice when we don't niche because in trying to help all people, we actually don't help our best clients as much as they need us to be helping them. That is a, I love that that's your takeaway. Okay. 1104. Anyone else have any questions? If not, I will shut her down and um, let you all to let you all get to the rest of your day. And um, it looks like no. So I think we're good. You're welcome. You're welcome. And tomorrow, what do we have? Tomorrow we have websites. Oh my gosh, that'll be a good one. So hope you can make it for that one. 
And with that, I'm going to duck out and hopefully see many of you further down the line. All right. Take care, everyone. Have a great day.